my name is Chris Philip, and I've been participating in various game jams since 2012, since the uh, Global Game Jam logo looked like that. Ever since, I've participated in the Taiga Game Jam as well, and while I was working as a game designer at Ubisoft, I've participated in, turn in, in their internal game jam. Since 2016, I've also been organizing game jams. I started organizing the Bucharest site for the Global Game Jam, and ever since I created Game Anglia, we've also been organizing events in the UK, and hopefully we're going to be organizing an international castle jam at some point next year. So, who here has actually participated in a game jam before? Let's just do a show of hands. Okay, have any of you actually organized game jams? Aha, yes, that's great. So for the people who haven't participated or organized game jams, here's how it usually works. You get a theme and you get a certain amount of time to actually make a game uh, on that theme. You ideate, you come up with really cool ideas, you add coffee, and then you start prototyping. You find bugs, some ideas are going to work, others aren't going to work so well, you get frustrated, and then you start cutting features. You cut features, you add, maybe add new ones, and if you've polished enough and if you've cut enough features, then what happens is that at the end of the game jam, you have a pretty cool game. You know, just like normal game development, but only in something like 24 to 48 hours. And game jams have um, been trending recently with companies like Sumo, EA, starting to create their own game jams internally. We have companies like uh, Sumo giving interviews about the game jams that they've created and the products, the new IP that they've developed th through those game jams. And we even have bigger companies like Bethesda, um, or even uh, indies like Big Blue Bubble and Onlya actually creating serious game jams, so um, <clears throat> an offshoot of the genre. And actually, Epic started Fortnite as part of a game jam. So it seems like game jams are really the, uh, the make-all, end-all, silver bullet that's going to solve all of your problems, right? Well, why wouldn't they believe that? We have games like Snake Pass, Goat Simulator, and Surgeon Simulator, with which were made by smaller indie studios, which were, part of the, which were the results of game jams. And even indies, people uh, and independent developers have actually uh, had success with game jams. So Titan Souls came out of a game jam as well as Super Hot, and the more recent Baba Is You, which won the IGF award at, um, at the IGF award earlier this year. So through all of this, it would seem like game jams are really cool. However, having been participating in game jams for a while now and organizing my own, I've chatted with quite a few developers about, uh, about internal game jams, and it seemed like their game jams may not necessarily be um, the best solution for certain problems. So I decided, okay, let's settle this once and for all and have a study about it. So I contacted 10 game development companies, some of them smaller, other, others bigger. For three of them, I'm still waiting for answers. And I ask them five questions. How did holding game jams improve your company's portfolio and value? Are you organizing your game jams internally or are you organizing them with an event company? Are your game jams open to the public or just to employees? And what are the best parts of organizing a game jam for your company other than creating new intellectual property? And lastly, were there any downsides to organizing game jams? Additionally, I've also had chats with the head of the Finnish Game Jam Association, as well as the, organizer, uh, the organizer of Slavic Game Jam, and I've read a lot of the articles that I could find on the subject. Here are the results. So, all companies see benefits in organizing game jams. Okay, case closed, let's go home. Or is it really that simple? Because a few of the companies that I contacted told me that they don't necessarily see game jams as beneficial for their company culture. In fact, only 50% of the companies that I surveyed actually improved their intellectual property from game jams. In terms of the study, all the, all the <clears throat> companies that I contacted organized their game jams internally, and 85% of them actually had employee-only game jams. So let's dive a bit more into the data, and let's see what game jams are good for. First, all across the board, I was told that game jams improve teamwork. This can be from giving visibility to what other team members are, work, are doing, to improving communications, to seeing how your team members are going to perform under a higher degree of pressure than usual. Secondly, it seemed like 
uh, game jams are really good for creating new processes and tools. For example, I had a few companies who told me that they created things like subtitle generators, um, level editors, and particle generators as part of game jams. And the reason they said that was, was because game jams g gave them a very focused period of time to concentrate on only one issue, create that level editor, create that ge uh, subtitle generator. And they didn't necessarily have to worry about approval from 10 levels, uh, 10 levels of seniority above them as you would normally find in a day-to-day -day activity. Additionally, new processes have been created. Things like, how can we take a 3D model from concept to implementation into a level um, as easy as possible? And during a game jam, what happens is that you can try out multiple ways of doing that, maybe even across multiple teams, and, he and then see what works and what doesn't. From that point of view, game jams can really be seen as a rapid iter iterative uh, process. Additionally, I've had quite a few companies, again, which told me that game jams helped them with creating uh, mini-games, creating mission ideas, and maybe even creating characters. So again, these very specific, very focused things. We also see the emergence of new dream teams through game jams, people who may not have worked together before, who now, due to the way that game jams are created, maybe some game jams actually create random teams, who... <coughs> Uh, suddenly see new highly performing teams appear during these game jams. Uh, the boss of Bossa actually said in an, in an interview to gamesindustry.biz that um, game jams are really good for onboarding new team members, for seeing how new team members can bring not just their technical skills to a problem, but also their non-technical skills. So during a game jam, it's really easy to see who really takes charge and leads teams, who can facilitate communication, or who just really hunkers down and creates those assets almost as in a factory. Um, <clears throat> so from that point of view, game jams are really good at that. Also, with big companies especially, game jams can provide a breather, a breath of fresh air. Here we have a team uh, of professionals from Ubisoft Bucharest who participated in the global game jam in 2017. And during 48 hours, they created a small couch multiplayer game, which one of them actually took forward and is now releasing on stream Greenlight. So what was really important for them was that uh, they came to an event where they could show everybody else and themselves that they can actually still make a game, a full game, in 48 hours. They weren't necessarily dragged down by um, an immense scope of a AAA game. They weren't necessarily dragged down by things like processes. They could just like focus and create something that was fun and something that was self-contained. In addition to this, uh, we have Sam from Butterscotch Shenanigans tell us that actually they've been able to notice an increase in productivity for two to three weeks after a game jam. This is a period of high creative um, value from those teams, during which those teams actually still change processes and are really open to, uh, to rethinking the way that they work and creating new productive ideas. And as I said earlier, Paul Porter uh, from Sumo Digital said in an interview that during game jams, talent really seems to percolate to the top. Okay, so this is the positive feedback. This is what people really like, seem to like game jams for. But what is it that game jams don't do so well? Well, first, remember that I gave you earlier about Epic uh, and Fortnite? Well, uh, it seems like it took them four more years from that game jam to actually produce the Fortnite that we now all know and love. So from that point of view, all of the examples, the success stories that we've seen earlier, Snake Pass, Super Hot, Baba Is You, all of those, what they do is they take one mechanic, maybe two mechanics, and really run with them. They polish them. They create new interesting ways in which those mechanics can be used to create a successful game. But that also means that you don't necessarily have the epic scope that you might get from a Grand Theft Auto. And the price points for your companies are going to be similar. So for example, um, Superhot is going to be priced lower than, uh, than a Grand Theft Auto. In addition to this, 
If you don't manage your, expect your um, developer's expectations, a game jam can lead to decreasing morale. One of the people that I interviewed actually told me that this is the number one thing that they do. They manage those expectations. They tell their employees that, you know what, the game that you're creating in 24 hours, in 48 hours, maybe even a week, that's not necessarily going to make it into our company's portfolio. We're not, we can't guarantee that it's going to be the next big hit. And if they don't do that, they said, what can happen is that teams at the end of a game jam can be very disappointed that they haven't made their company's next uh, big IP. Lastly, and this was a surprise for me, you need to realize that uh, the teams who are actually organizing game jams also need rest, that they're going to organize the game jams during company time, and that they're going to need time after the game jam happens to actually take a breather and come back into their normal uh, pace of things. As somebody who organizes game jumps, as I said, this was really surprising for me. In addition to this, take into account the time that's being used to both organize a game jam and participate in a game jam, because mostly your employees are going to want to participate in a game jam during the working week, and they're not necessarily going to be available for the whole 48 hours or 24 hours of the game jam, because they have families and they have lives as well. And actually, when I was talking to Anna Kaisa from uh, the Finnish Game Jam Association. And again, keep in mind that this was a completely informal chat. We, um, what she suggested was that maybe game jams can actually have, uh, an, can put an emphasis on the crunch culture that we see so often in nowadays Eastern, Central and Eastern Europe, especially with outsourcing companies, and that they can emphasize uh, only the fun parts of, um, of the game making process. So keep in mind that this was an informal chat. We don't yet have data to put behind this, but I thought it would be a really interesting thing to feature and to have as food for thought. So are game jams good for your company? Should you organize game jams? Are game jams the next big thing for, uh, for yourself and for the developers that you work with? Well, yes and no. So if you want a team, building, a team building activity that's going to be really great and increase morale for your teams, then by all means organize a game jam. Do you want your, to create a next big hit for your company? Well, from that point of view, the results are more uh, vague and we don't know if game jams are really the best way to create new intellectual property, especially since this can come with a multitude of factors if your company works with external stakeholders or with external IP holders. Let's dive a bit more into that. So first, when you're organizing internal game jams, say that you decided to organize an internal game jam, you have to make design decisions in order for team building, tools building and process creation, and lastly, for new IP. And when I say design decisions, you have to approach this as you would uh, a game or UX design. What is it that you want to get out of it, and how are you going to create actual mechanics to be able to um, facilitate Example, if you're uh, organizing a game jam where you really want to see team building, what you might want to do is create only random teams or have parts of the game jam where teams can actually get together and talk about their processes. Similarly, if you want to create a game jam out of which you can have a lot of cool tools or processes being developed, maybe make sure that at the beginning of the game jam, your teams know what you're aiming for. What are the problems that you're trying to solve with that game jam if it's not necessarily just to create a new IP? And lastly, if you really want to make a new IP, make sure that you manage the expectations of the participants. That, for example, if you want one new IP and you have 10 development teams, maybe nine of those teams are, games aren't going to make it in your company's portfolio. Another really interesting thing to mention is that internal game jams are also really good for giving your uh, teams a breath of fresh air if your company's NDAs don't allow for them to actually go to external game jams or external, external events. So if you'd like to organize external game jams, keep those usually for recruiting and for PR. As far as I could tell, um, Creative Assembly does that, as well as, from my experience, uh, the Ubisoft that I used to work with, Ubisoft Beakers, also did that. They had two different game jams for two diff different purposes. And lastly, to conclude, game jams, they're a new tool that we have. They definitely have a place in the games industry, and we're going to keep seeing more and more come up and they're really good at tackling exact issues, but they haven't yet been perfected for creating great overarching games. 
when you're organizing a game jam, take into account the resources that are being used to organize, to organize those, and that can be time, people, as well as time off from your other projects. And <clears throat> what I'd really like to encourage you is that we are a connected community. Games themselves are really connected and the games industry is really connected with each other. So if you're organizing internal game jumps, if you're organizing external game jumps, come and talk about them. Try new things, talk about them, take results, measure your KPIs. Because how we're going to grow the industry as a whole and really refine the format for a game jump, for example, is we need to talk to each other about what worked and what didn't. Uh, <clears throat> As I was saying earlier, I really believe that we need further study on this. For example, I'd like to do a study on what the differences are in organizing game jams between indie companies and AAA companies, between mobile development companies and console development companies, or even between the different departments which organize the game jam. So for example, how does a game jam, which is being organized by your human resources department, different from a game jam that's being organized for, by your PR department, different from a game jam that's being organized just by that one guy who's really passionate about game jams. So that's about it. Thank you a lot for coming. Feel free to um, follow me on Twitter or send me an email if you have any questions. I'm more than open to discussing this. And I'm really looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Hi, Chris. Thanks for the talk. So um, this talk was focused more on game jams in companies. Yeah. And I know you've organized game jams for communities, and there's global game jam, and there's some independent game jams. Uh, can you share with us briefly uh, some benefits or maybe uh, bad things about local and community game jams? So, and as I slightly touched upon earlier, when you're organizing community game jams, you have to really be aware of your community. What's the makeup? Uh, what's their makeup? So is it that they're only AAA companies? Is it that they're only indie companies? Or are they a mix of both? What we find during the Bucharest Global Game Jam is that we actually have a mix of AAA uh, hardened veterans and students who are just uh, coming into the process. And what's really important for us is to make sure that we ensure communications between those two, two groups, because that's when we actually see new ideas unfolding and new connections being made. So for example, I know of at least one person who is now employed within uh, a AAA company in Bucharest because they met somebody uh, from that company at a game jam and they were able to uh, prove themselves. However, that's never um, our purpose when we're organizing uh, the Bucharest Global Game Jam for a game jump for us it's always about uh, really improving the community and growing that community and making sure that there's opportunities for them to to learn from each other in terms of downsides I would say that if you do have a company uh, like a really big company that doesn't allow their employees to participate because of NDAs that part of the community can really feel left out so it's really important for us to also manage uh, those stakeholders any other questions Okay, cool. Thanks a lot.